all this is dr mobin sayed from drbean.com welcome to one more show so continuing with our series on pediatric pelvic reconstruction surgery we have dr mark a levitt once again with us welcome uh, dr mark dr. hi there levitt. so very quickly let me for those who are joining in this lecture for the first time this is dr mark a levitt he is actually in children's national hospital Recently, Mark A. Levitt, MD, colorectal and pelvic reconstructive surgeon, joined our Children's National Hospital community to lead our new highly specialized colorectal surgery program. This program will be the first in the mid-Atlantic region to fully integrate surgery, urology, gynecology, gastroenterology into one cohesive program for children. And check this out. Dr. Levitt is an internationally recognized expert in the surgical care and treatment of pediatric colorectal disorders, he has performed over 10,000 surgeries to address a wide spectrum of problems. So once again, uh, Dr. Levitt, uh, welcome and thank you very much for being with us. Great to be here. As, um, I, I really enjoy these sessions. So thank you for having me. Excellent. So let's start. Today, the topic is the so last time we discussed the anorectal malformations. Today we are going to talk about post-operative complications, correct? Yes. So we spent a lot of time last session talking about the diagnosis and the treatment. Um, well, after surgery, not always is there success. And I think it's really important to talk about why not and then what one can do about it. Got it. So a quick um, heads up to the viewers. These, uh, this is a pelvic reconstruction surgery for pediatric patients. These are the talks. These are the concepts, medical concepts that we med medical professionals, medical students have to learn. So for us, this, these are important talks, but these talks may be disturbing for some of the viewers. So viewer discretion is advised. If you do not have a direct uh, interest in these sur surgery talks, then please uh, feel free to um, not watch. So, Dr. Levitt, thank you once again, and let's start. So, what I'm uh, going to show you at first are all the things that can uh, go wrong um, after surgery, and then what needs to be done about that. And um, here is the list of what I would call post PSARP problems. And you remember from the last session, PSARP means posterior sagittal anorectoplasty, which is the surgical reconstruction done for a patient who is born without an anal opening and the anus needs to be created. The anus is almost always there. It's just hiding inside, needs to be found, mobilized and placed in the correct position. So. What can go wrong? Well, in a female, the perineal body, which is the space between the vagina and the anus, might break down. And then the anus and the vagina are next to each other with no space in between. Um, the anus can be placed in a mislocated way, meaning not exactly where the sphincter mechanism belongs. Uh, the anus so I have a quick question, though. My apologies. So last time we saw that there were some malformations that were by birth. Are these the malformations even after reconstructive surgery? Yeah. So all of these are things that can happen after what was thought to be successful reconstructive surgery, but the way the tissues healed or the technique that was used can lead to these anatomic problems, which obviously can have impact on the child's prognosis for bowel control. Because certainly if the anus is not in the right position relative to the sphincter muscles, then the sphincter muscles can be really good, but they won't successfully close the anal opening because the anal opening is not where it should be. Got um, it. Thank so you. similar to that, a stricture, which is a scar a connotes a narrowed anal area uh, can occur from poor healing related to the anus that was reconstructed. You could have an inappropriate connection 
between the rectum and the vagina called a rectovaginal fistula. You can have a septum, meaning the surgeon failed to notice that the vagina has a wall down the middle, almost making it like two vaginas, and that needs to be recognized and managed. Um, you can have what's called a persistent urogenital sinus, meaning the urethra and the vagina are supposed to be separate structures. And if the surgeon fails to recognize that they are dealing with a cloaca, they might repair just the rectum and leave the urethra and the vagina as a single unit, which obviously is not ideal. You can have prolapse of the rectum. The rectum can have extra tissue that's pushing out and that gets in the way. Um, and then you can have a remnant of the original fistula. The old rectum was not completely dissected. Now these seem like a lot of things that can go wrong. The vast majority of patients do extremely well and don't have any of these problems. Um, but we need to know about them. We need to evaluate them. And I think it's important to recognize that these patients may have had surgery when they were a baby and they may not be aware of these anatomic issues until they start to use that anus, until it's time to try that anus out for bowel control. And if they're unable to do it, it's possible that the reason why they can't do it is because of an anatomic cause. Got it, thank you. Okay, so let's talk about a couple scenarios. Would you offer a redo to a patient whose analplasty is not in the center of their sphincter? And I sort of alluded to the fact that the answer to this is certainly yes. If the surgeon inadvertently placed the anus not precisely within the sphincter mechanism, then that anus will not work, even though there are good sphincter muscles that are perfectly happy to do their job, but their job is to close the anal opening. And if the anal opening is not in the center of them, all the closing maneuvers will not keep the poop from passing out as an accident. So in such a case, I would move the anus surgically to be better located within the sphincter mechanism. Got it. And tell me this, is this actually sometimes possible that the previous surgery has left enough of anomalies that further correction is not possible or this is always possible? Well, in a, in an experienced set of hands that deals with a lot of these problematic patients, it's always possible. The anus is usually in this circumstance is there, you see it, but it's not conducive with bowel control because it needs to be moved. Not far. I mean, we're talking, you know, half an inch difference, but what a big difference that makes if the anal opening is not in the center of the sphincter. And then after surgery, you now have placed it in the center of the sphincter. Got it. Thank you very much. So the other scenario that occurs is prolapse and there's an extra tissue. It looks reddish. Um, and um, if that extra tissue is visible, that can be a problem because first of all, it might have mucus and wet, it can wet the underwear. The underwear can rub against that mucosa and cause little bloody staining of the underwear. And then if you think about it, if you want your anus to close, there's a prolapse tissue pushing through. You can't close the hole all the way. It's like there's a foot in the door. So again, in this circumstance, I would offer a redo and would trim off the prolapse. Got it. So would you offer a redo to a patient who has a stricture, a scar tissue? Well, imagine that you're trying to pass stool and the bottom part, the very bottom part, right at the skin level is narrow because of a scar. That's another case that is amenable to a redo procedure to remove the scar and put a healthy piece of rectum down to the anus so it will work well and will not inhibit flow because the scar is not distensible. 
So I have a question here, and this is something that I was discussing with a surgeon friend, and this is just for me, it is, it is a curiosity, and that is, if there is a scar developed, there must have been something done during the last surgery that the scar developed. Now, how are we sure that new surgery will not cause similar scarring? I think it's a very reasonable question. A scar or stricture develops because of tension or loss of blood supply or both. So I think that if you respect the principles where the pull through, the rectal part, has good blood supply and has no tension, you should not end up with a scar. So when you redo such a case, I usually find that the rectum was not mobilized enough to avoid tension and didn't have the best blood supply. So it shouldn't happen again, provided you respect those principles. Got it. Thank you. All right, so here is another complication that shows, if you look at the image, they're both both similar scenarios. The bladder itself is not supposed to empty in that direction. It's supposed to empty towards the front. What the surgeon did here is they went in posterior sagittally, like I showed you during the last session, and instead of grabbing the rectum, they in fact grabbed the urinary tract and pulled that to the anus. This is a disastrous complication, but it can occur is if you do not know where to find the rectum. And we made a whole discussion last time about how you find the rectum. If you remember, you really like the uh, statue, the Rodin statue, which delineates where the rectum can be in a patient with anorectal malformation. The surgeon has that information in their mind. They go in and they know where to look for the rectum. So if the surgeon does not have a good image, it would be like me trying to go to your house right now without GPS. It's very unlikely I will find you. But with a working GPS, I will appear at your door. So GPS is the contrast study. It's the distal colostrogram. And in these cases, the surgeon didn't know exactly where to find the rectum because of poor preoperative radiology, went in, thought they found it, and in fact pulled through something they ought not to have pulled through. Got it. So this would be the pull through of urethra to anoplasty? That's right. Both of those. All right. Now, this is an image of the bladder emptying into the urethra. And as you notice, there's a section that's very, very narrow. That is called a urethral stricture. And how to manage that? It might be amenable to dilation of the urethra. However, most likely, you're going to have to patch that area. Um, in order to get there to be successful flow uh, into the normal urethra. And how does this happen? This happened from the surgeon initially dissecting the rectum and being too close to the urethra and injuring it. This is an important complication as well. So is this a urethra that was injured and then healed by scarring and became... That, that's right. That's stricted. right. And, and now the child cannot successfully void... So we either have to reconstruct the urethra or, or bypass the urethra. So one option that's not listed here would be to do what's called a metropinoff, which mm -hmm. we're going to mention in the next session about management of fecal incontinence. Metrophenoff can be made to access the bladder through the abdominal wall and take the urine out that way. And then you do not need a urethra through which to empty your bladder. And is that a lifelong uh, yes, outcome? That would be lifelong. So in this particular case, I might consider reconstructing this urethra using choices B or C. Got it. And there's a question. Kelly says, is anatomy so different in different children that a mistake like that could be made? Yes, a mistake. Well, no, the anatomy is not that different compared to adults. Um, of course, the difference is that you're dealing with a congenital problem. So you have to find the rectum. There's no rectum because there wasn't, the baby wasn't born 
with that anatomy in the right location. So of course that's different than in an adult. And if you don't know where to go searching for the rectum, you can injure other things. It's pretty precarious, that, that space. Got it. Thank you very much. So these are some images. And what they show is behind the bladder. So if you can show the bladder, no, that's, um, look at the bladder. Oh, sorry. The bladder is the white thing in the front. No, is this the one? That, that guy. And in the other image, it's bigger. The white thing in the front. Yep. And you'll notice that just behind the bladder, on the left side, it looks white, like, like uh, Casper the Friendly Ghost. And in the back, it looks sort of gray. Is a circular thing has a D in it on the image on the right. So what is that? That does That's not belong. That does not belong there. Amazingly, that is the original rectum, the original end of the rectum that was left behind because the surgeon was too timid. They didn't go close enough to the urinary tract to separate the rectum away from it, leaving behind a structure called a roof, remnant of the original fistula. And that is, that's a problem because in the left, it's actually filling with urine. You can see it's the same color as the bladder. And so after a successful urination, after a successful void, this child will dribble urine all day long because that little pouch is emptying its urine that it had been filled with. So the, it, these, in both these circumstances, the roof, the remnant of the original fistula needs to be removed. Very interesting. So this is actually left accidentally or intentionally, and then it is connected with the urinary system. So well, urine you, know, void... you know it was originally connected to the urinary system, I because see. it was congenitally connected in the form of a fistula. I see. So that part was that... never removed, never successfully dissected. I see. I see. So now urine is not only voided, but, uh, but, but it also collects in here. And then That's it just right. keeps dribbling. That's right. Got it. All right. So let's talk a little bit about soiling. Um, I think I mentioned last time that I've never met a patient that had a baby born with an anorectal malformation that actually knew that that was something that could go wrong. I think a child's ability to poop and a child's ability to have normal bowel control is something we all take for granted. So when I discuss a patient with them, their patient, their child with them that has been born without a normal anal opening, they're very surprised that that was something that could go wrong. And I can tell you, they don't care much about the elegance of the anal reconstruction that I'm about to do. They care about what? They care about whether that anal repair will work successfully for their child in order to have normal bowel control. That is the question. Yeah. Uh, that That's is on, interesting. That's on their mind. And Texas says, love it that these babies can have a normal life with the proper surgery. And Dr. Levitt's kind of remedial surgery to correct surgeries wrote in classic reference to guide surgeons. Yeah, so this surgery is, can create normal anatomy, absolutely. But I will tell you, um, the one thing about this kind of surgery that's uh, probably the most frustrating for surgeons is that you can do a perfect operation, but you can still have soiling. And the reason why you can still have soiling is because the patient's sacrum and spine, which I mentioned last time, can negatively influence the potential for achieving bowel control, even with a good operation. Of course, you need a good operation. And the beginning of this talk was about some inadequacies in the original surgery that may need to be corrected. But even with a good operation, the patients may soil because they don't have all the continence factors because either their sacrum or their spine does not develop correctly, and therefore the innervation, the nerve connection 
and the sphincters, the muscles that surround that anal opening, are in some way deficient. So this is a discussion about why such a patient soils. Our first step always is to check the anatomy. We need to be absolutely certain that their anatomy was reconstructed correctly. But even if it was done correctly, we still may have patients that soil. And obviously this is the biggest fear because we want this patient in normal underwear not having this kind of problem that you see on the slide. Got it. Thank you very much. So as a reminder from the previous talk, the predictors of continence are where was the rectum? What is the height of the malformation? Second is what is the quality of the sacrum? How well developed is the pelvis and particularly the sacrum bone? Because if the sacrum bone develops well, so too do the muscles and the nerves. And finally, is there a nerve connection that is not going to give the best sensation or muscular contraction of the sphincters. So imagine you have a perfectly done operation with a good anoplasty, but the child has, let's say, a myelomeningocele. Something's wrong with the spine, and therefore the way to contract the sphincters has been impair impaired. We're gonna go through some of this next time when we talk about the management of fecal incontinence in children. Got it. Thank you very much. All right. So we have an anorectal malformation patient with soiling. How do we make them better? Do we give them laxatives to provoke more stool? Or do we do enemas? Or do we do something else? So these pictures show a colon on the left that's full of stool with actually some impacted stool in the rectal area and a corresponding contrast study, which shows a big ball of stool in the pelvis. And this patient is getting very constipated, and now we have to figure out how to manage the patient. Most of the time, the patient can be managed by treating the constipation with laxatives. But remember, if you give someone laxatives, you then have to feel the poop and hold it in and then reach a bathroom on time. And if you don't have the mechanisms of continence available to you because your sacrum or spine are not adequately influencing the sphincter success, laxatives will not help. Laxatives will just make for more accidents. Those are patients that need what I consider a mechanical way of emptying their colon. And if you can mechanically empty the colon, like with an enema, once a day, and the stool does not pass any time during the next 24 hours until the next enema is given, you have rendered the child clean, artificially so, but clean, what I would call socially continent, and able to wear normal underwear because they are reliably emptying once every 24 hours and they are not passing stool any other time. And would this be lifelong as well, or will they improve as they age so, further? Another very good question. It may be lifelong, depending on the quality of the sacrum and spine, although many patients are borderline. And I think getting them clean artificially is a bridge to them ultimately achieving continence. So if we can help them get clean mechanically with an enema, and then they have normal underwear and they like being clean, in a year from now, we say, okay, let's try to potty train. The child is much more likely to be cooperative because they want to remain clean. So it is sometimes a bridge to continence. My uh, firm belief is that a child at around age three or four ought to be in normal underwear, just like all their friends. They either achieve it successfully on their own or they need bowel management with a daily enema to achieve that level of success. Got it. One question, and then we'll go back to these slides. So Kelly says, soluble fiber laxatives? Well, we will get to this question, but soluble fiber and laxative are three different terms. Fiber can be soluble or insoluble. That provides bulk to the stool or thinness to the stool. 
the laxative is what provokes the 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 colon to empty so let give me a couple more slides and i will um, el elucidate that got it oh sorry i do not know why it keeps that's okay that's a good slide uh, so this is this is a really um, interesting picture and if you are looking carefully at this you see that there is peristalsis there is haustral markings all the way down to the pelvis so that's clearly abnormal the rectum does not have haustra this is evidence that the original surgery in fact, the surgery that was done before the advent of the PSARP, which I talked about last time, the rectum was removed in these patients and the sigmoid colon was pulled through. And you know this is sigmoid because you see the haustral markings and there is no rectum in there. So the patient in this case has lost their rectal reservoir. They can't hold the stool as well. And these patients are often incontinent and they move too quickly. So this is a patient that probably needs enemas and may actually need treatment to slow them down like loperamide rather than laxatives because they don't have a rectal reservoir. This operation really is no longer done today, but you might see a patient who has this anatomy that had one of the older versions of the operation before the advent of the PSAR that we talked about last time. Got it. And this image shows an x-ray on the left side that is full of stool. You see little sort of pebbles all the way through the colon. Even up here? Yep, that's all stool. Little rocks. Even here? Stool. Even yep, this dark spot? Stool. That's stool. And the mm -hmm. contrast study on the right shows a very dilated rectosigmoid. This patient is on the has a tendency to be constipated and poor a poor emptier needs laxatives if they have the continence mechanism or enemas if they do not have a good continence mechanism. Got it. So what I've quoted you here is a study that we ran of the success of bowel management. This was the first study of its kind for, for to provide long-term outcome. Prior studies had only showed success at one week. This is success at one year. And we do quite well, but we're still not at 100%. So other patients still need to work on this. But we apply a bowel management program, which is very nursing intensive, to try to get the colon to be controlled. We want the colon to empty once per 24 hours, either with the right dose of laxatives and nothing passes for the next 24 hours, or an enema that successfully empties the colon, and all the stool that accumulates over the next 24 hours does not leak out until the next enema comes along and empties it. That's what I call bowel management. Got it. And here are some pictures that show um, how you get the colon to empty mechanically. Of course, rectal enemas are an option. By the way, if anyone's curious, the boy on the top left photo has what's called a baclofen pump, that, that thing on his abdomen. That, that's one of the tubes that I'm going to be talking about. But the big circular thing, which maybe you're noticing, relates to you know his neurosurgical needs related to his spine. So he has a, a, a tube. And in the center photo, you see what we do with such a tube. We run enema fluid into the colon, and then that flushes the colon through. And if we do a special operation called a Malone procedure, we can actually have the belly button look like it does in that photo, which looks quite normal. But actually, there's a tiny hole there that connects to the appendix, and through which the colon can receive a tube and the tube can administer the enema. And then when you're done with the enema, you just take the tube out. Well, this looks pretty interesting yeah. compared to this kind of a structure. Yeah, so some, some kids need a tube because they don't want the belly button accessed. And other kids 
don't want a tube and they want to be accessed. So we give the victim both options. Got it. Now, why is this here? This is a, a sand timer and it's a reminder as to why colorectal surgery is so challenging. And I think I alluded to this before, but if you do a surgical repair of an anus at a, in a baby, let's say at three months of age, you don't really know if you did a good job until four years later when the child either successfully or unsuccessfully tries to potty train. So how is a surgeon supposed to know if they don't achieve success four years hence what they did wrong with the original operation. This is unique to colorectal surgery. In most of surgery, if you do something incorrect, you know about it very quickly because the patient does not get better. In anorectal malformations, you can actually go in, find the anus, put it in the wrong location, leave yourself with a roof, a remnant of the original fistula, leave prolapse, and the kid is fine. They're pooping. They're having their diaper changed. No one really knows that there's an anatomic problem until you say, time to potty train, Johnny. And Johnny does not successfully potty train. And in why? He doesn't have the right anatomy and needs to be reconstructed. How do you possibly learn from your mistake four years hence? So it's a very difficult field for that reason. That's why I'm fighting so hard to get... Um, surgeon's experience and doing the operation correctly and i would love to no longer need to do any reoperations. that would be great success in my mind got it and thank you very much for this effort so what this slide represents is how we did when we offered a reoperation, and our patients with reoperation did very well their functional outcomes improved as well as their quality of life. So this reaffirms my core principle, get the correct anatomy, and then they most likely will succeed. And if they don't succeed, then we do bowel management. So these are very good results after doing a reoperation. And I think the next slide shows something quite similar. And that is here were the patients after a redo, and if you look at the, um, um, the pie graph at the top, those were patients who had good potential, but had an anatomic problem with their repair. And look how many were converted to cleanliness. 80% were made clean, 20% continued to soil after a reoperation. That's very successful. Of course, I'd love it to be 100%, but Particularly interesting was the group at the bottom, the bottom of pie graph, patients that we would have been considered to have no potential or poor potential to achieve bowel control who underwent a reoperation. 20% developed their own control, and an additional 40% were successfully clean with a mechanical program. So about 80% of patients after a redo can be successful and clean. And that's really exciting news for patients who have an anal repair done in the past, but do not have the best anatomy. They can be offered a redo by a center that's experienced in reoperative surgery. And in many cases, we can get them clean by improving their anatomy. Got it. Thank you very much. So one quick image of the um, one other option for access, this is called a cecostomy, where the cecum is connected to the abdominal wall. You can actually see the appendix is there unused. This is a really good option in a patient, which I'll talk about on our next session, who might need that appendix in the future for a urologic procedure, but wants very much to be clean artificially and mechanically by emptying out of the colon. Here we've created an access to the colon, but we haven't utilized the appendix. We're saving the appendix for collaboration with our urologist in the future. And I'm going to talk about that in the next session. And here's what a Malone looks like. This is a surgery whereby we take the appendix and we connect it to the usually the belly button. 
And through that opening in the belly button, we showed you the picture of the patient's belly button, who looks like a normal belly button. We have a catheterizable channel, and we have now wrapped the cecum around the appendix to create a valve-like mechanism so no stool can leak backward. And that's what you see there. It's quite pretty. And uh, we put that to the belly button. And does this end attach with the belly button? Yes. That un goes to the underside of the belly button. You don't see any of that red tissue. Got it. And this is the appendix, and this is the cecum wrapping around it. That's correct. If Got you've it. ever heard of a Nissen fundoplication for gastroesophageal reflux, it's the same principle. Got it. And then the obvious question is what happens if you don't have an appendix? Maybe that someone's had their appendix removed. This is an operation called a neo appendix whereby we take a rectangle off of the colon wall. You can see that on the picture on the left. It's based on a single blood vessel where the purple marks are. We then roll that out, which is the picture on the top right, and then we tubularize it. And it looks a lot like, a, like an appendix again. That's a neo appendix. It's for patients. Very with interesting. So you take this marked part because it has the singular blood supply. Yes. You bring it out, then you make it into a tube and then attach a tube to it. That's right. So for example, in a patient who has no appendix or a patient who needs their appendix for their urology procedure, we can still give them access for their colon to flush the colon. Very cool surgery. This is very cool. Thank you very much for doing these helpful things. And this is a picture of the appendix split. And amazingly, the part on the right can be used for the urologic procedure, and the part on the left can be used for the Malone appendicostomy. So we have successfully shared the appendix. That's why I think it's vitally important to care for such children in a collaborative environment where you have colorectal surgeons and urologists working together. Here we have a single operation and a single appendix that is being used for two purposes. Very interesting. So you have incised here, and then this is one part, and this is the other part. And they have kept, their blood, can... they have kept their blood supply. Very interesting. So I just want to end with this thought and compliments to the beautiful artiste who made uh, this picture of this little girl, your very own, the host. Thank you for uh, being a great host and artist. Um, Thank you. A six-year-old girl came to our clinic with daily soiling, wearing a diaper, teased at school, who came for our bowel management program, as I've described here. And I said, in a week, you will be clean and in normal underwear. And then she said to me, well, she didn't actually say it out loud, but she was clearly thinking, I'm an adult and I have no clue. I couldn't possibly deliver on that promise. Well, she came in a week later and she said, Dr. Levitt, you make good promises. And for me, it was very, very impactful because she wanted that. She wanted to be clean and dry and normal underwear. And we were able to deliver that. And it's why I'm very passionate about this field, trying to deliver these promises for such kids. Thank you very much. So I just have one question and I'll see if anyone here has a question or not. When we were discussing the appendix um, usage, what about appendicitis? Do these patients sometimes develop appendicitis as well? And then what do you do? So they can't get appendicitis because the opening to the appendix is free to the world. It's accessible by a catheter. The only reason why you get appendicitis is when the appendix cannot empty its mucus because at the opening to the appendix, a little tiny piece of stool has become lodged. That can't possibly happen if the appendix is open at the tip. So no appendicitis. It is in addition to being great for bowel management purposes, it also is the ultimate cure for appendicitis. 
Got it. Thank you very much. So we don't have questions, but we have a lots of comments thanking you for your work and rightfully so. Uh, when you were discussing this, I was thinking that you and colleagues like you are the angels for these little ones and for humanity in general who repair, reconstruct, help them be, uh, be normal, as normal as possible again. So thank you very much for your work. I'll tell you, I'll tell you a story. We had one of my trainees um, was working to become a pediatric colorectal surgeon. He was a very quiet guy. And we asked our staff, uh, we have a weekly meeting. We asked them to submit pictures that are important to them from their week or anything they want to talk about. And he submitted a picture of two little boys playing baseball. He was a big baseball player and fan um, before he became a doctor. And he was very quiet. And we said, why did you submit this picture? Everyone needs to explain why they submit the picture. And he said, when I saw this picture of two kids playing baseball, and baseball is near and dear to my heart, I realized what is our mission with the care of these children. Our mission is that those kids, we want the kids that we take care of to play baseball or whatever they decide to do and not have a care in the world about their bowels or having an accident or anything like that. We just want them to be normal and regular kids that enjoy their life. So it, this is all about quality of life. And it's really a, a reason why I find it easy to be very passionate about the field. These patients need us um, because they are suffering. And we have great ways with surgical techniques to um, uh, make them better. Absolutely. So with this, thank you very much. Cool Beans, thank you very much for being here. Dr. Levitt, thank you very much for your work and then thank for you. teaching the world about this as well. Uh, I'm sure that many, many uh, healthcare providers and students would benefit from it. And I think even patients and their uh, parents or their family members would benefit from this as well. So thank you for taking your time to do this. Thank you. And I'll look forward to seeing you the next time. Perfect. Bye-bye for now. Bye-bye.